So trying to present this to Right Honourable Lord Kinnock of their building after which we'll be here. They kept him in a bit longer than the war, actually. And sure enough, after a continued struggle and massive sacrifice, which everybody in this audience is familiar with, India secured independence in 1947 and became a republic just a few years later. He fought for the illegalization of racial abuse and discrimination, mocked when he started that with private members' bills in 1951. Mocked even as we came to the general election of 1964. Honored just after the election in which he was defeated marginally in Eaton and Slough by the introduction of the 1965 Race Relations Act by the Wilson Labour government. Profit again in his own land, eventually honored after decades of struggle. He was an inveterate anti-racist. And that cause inspired 
his attitudes at home and abroad. He was an inveterate anti-colonizer. He was one of the four founder members of War on Want, a cause close to the Prime Minister's heart and fundamental to the prospect of securing a world that is stable because it enjoys security and plenty. That battle is still going on. So I am honored to receive a medal that bears the name of Fenner Brockwood. India. I suppose that my view of India, my affection for India, my respect for India, was sparked at about the age of five when my Uncle Bill came home from the Army of India in 1947. Came home resplendent in his jobbers and his artillery officer's uniform. Why? Because they'd lost all the rest of his kit. And he turned up at the terraced house of my grandfather, facing Teacher's Colliery in Tradiga, and my grandfather's first words to him when he opened the door where the bloody hell do you think you are going dressed like that? <laughs> Uncle Bell brought tales of India, and he had illegally been engaged in, in 1945 and 46, and campaigned for the Congress Party when it was an illegal movement. He had that in common with thousands of other British servicemen who, having experienced India, whatever their original attitude, and of course, he had a deep political commitment before even going there from Burma, where he fought. And like so many others, seeing India, hearing Congress, talking to the youngsters who were making a new country, he almost automatically volunteered at some danger to himself. But the tales he brought or home. And retail, in a way that he never told war stories throughout the rest of his life, were tales of the most heartrending hardship and the most inspiring courage, of the most fantastic witness of poverty on an unimaginable scale, and the boldness and insistence and determination of those who thought that the beginning of the answer to that was the achievement of real self-determination and liberty. That cause was reinforced by my grandfather, who expressed it rather more simply. I once asked him in the 1950s, Gramps, why were you so committed to the idea of getting rid of colonies? It happened at the time, actually, in the late 50s, when Ghana secured independence, and the old man, an ex-collier, had a drink on it. And this bewildered me just a little bit, even as a teenager. Why are you so committed? And he said, well, India started, he said, because I reckon that if Churchill was against independence, <laughs> we were for it. <laughs> <laughs> because the only thing he was right about in all his life, he said, was the Nazis. And he used to say it the same way as Churchill did. And he was a fair old guide to the way in which I can should conduct my judgment for the remainder of my life. In the decades since, I've had extraordinary experience of Indians and India. It is invidious to select two. One is Swashport. 